As a kid, I honestly thought our childhood was normal. Until I grew up, I realized we grew up a little different in Ujima Village. I feel that Compton is right now the worst it's ever been. Everything I've ever known my whole life, the city took it away and they knocked our projects down and they kicked us out and they just left us out to dry to be homeless. I got shot right here, man, and it fucks me up to stand here now and relive that. The other person that was behind me was dead on the scene. You know, his noodles is out. His brains is out. But the message is to get across that we're trying to do something out here in these streets. We've been out here. We just trying to wake y'all up, y'all up, y'all up. The first time I've known about somebody getting killed, like somebody who I know personally, or somebody who I know personally who killed someone, um, was young, probably about six years old. But the first time I actually like seen somebody get killed, like watched it, I don't remember the exact age, but it was around like third or fourth grade. My name is Bernard Burrell. I grew up Compton, California, Ujima Village, and this is my story. Normalizing trauma was something that I didn't even know. It wasn't even trauma to me because it was really just that normal, you know? Every day I come outside, it's such and such got shot or such and such went to jail. And, you know, I grew up with a thousand, two thousand friends and half of them is dead or in jail doing life right now. So, it, like I said, it's sad to say, but that was normal to me. So it really wasn't, it wasn't trauma. So normalizing trauma was actually easy because that was my normal life, you know? And that's just what I was comfortable with because that's all I've ever known. My normal is different from a lot of people. I've been through so much to where, my nigga, I don't even feel nothing no more. Like after you lose your parents, you lose your career, my nigga, you get shot, you lose some friends, but you see all these things growing up, my nigga, like you get immune to it, you get used to it. So for me, my nigga, like, I'm just like, after a point, how much more do I gotta keep taking? My name's David Hamilton. They call me Super Crip, man. I'm from West Side Nutty, you feel me? We really out here, real motherfuckers. I mean, for me, bro, like, we always had these conversations, you know? It's, um, it is normal. It's sad to say, but we see it every day. But for me, my nigga, like, you know, I can't speak for nobody else but me, man. Growing up in, uh, in Santana, man, it was crazy because uh, on my block was like the block where everybody hung out at. So we could be outside playing football or playing basketball, and somebody would just come through and do a drive-by, and we will just like see them do a drive-by, and they leave and we'll go right back playing. Like that's how, we, that's how much we got used to it. It was just a way of life. It, I mean, it, you just have to live your life. It is what it is. My name is Jeff Trepanier uh, from Compton, California. Uh, born and raised, went to Compton High, went to USC, NBA, and this is my story. So my sister, she, she was the, the, the gangster of the family. Like uh, she was the one gang banging. My, my older brother and myself, we didn't gang bang, we, we was in sports, but like she was in the streets, she hung out with all the, all the thugs around the neighborhood, and uh, she she ended up going to jail because uh, she was selling drugs, and her and her, her posse was out in Nebraska, and they, uh, the police did a drug raid on the house, uh, arrested everybody, and she didn't tell, and she was 17, 18 years old, facing 10 years minimum, and all she had to do was tell, and she didn't tell, so she ended up doing 10 years fed time. Like, she was the real one for that, because I would have told. <laughs> I would have told for sure. <laughs> you would have ran it all. Man. Growing up in Ujima Village was, it was a little different. As a kid, I thought, I thought, I honestly thought our childhood was normal. You know, we ran around and we did all the fun games and played tag and shot marbles and, you know, I thought we had a pretty normal childhood. 
until I grew up and start, you know, finding out how other people grew up in their apartment complexes and stuff like that. And I realized we grew up a little different in Ujima Village. Um, you know, we was in a little apartment. My mom got six kids and always took care of her siblings and her nieces and nephews. So we always had a packed house, no matter what. Four people to a bedroom and, you know, so I'm just used to that, 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 that big family. I never really had nothing, nothing special. Um, but we always made it work, man. We had a lot of fun. Um, definitely a lot of gang activities growing up in my, in my community. Um, but again, I, I thought it was normal. About a decade ago, they actually tore our neighborhood down, um, knocked down all of our apartments. And it's just really sad just going back over there to see nothing. Village. This is my hometown right here, man. This is my hometown, man. This is where I'm going to raise. Right here, Ujima Village. Right here in this section right here, this is the middle. This separate Wildsworth and Clovis. This is the middle right here, man. And you know, this is everything I've ever known. This is a place that I've been since I was born, since I was a little kid. From daycare to preschool, kindergarten. I had to leave the house at five in the morning to get on three trains from the green line to the blue line to the red line all the way to Hollywood to get on buses it was just too much getting to school to the valley so I didn't go I was leaving the house at five in the morning going to my neighborhood every day or going to Centennial um it's kind of crazy I actually played for Centennial as a freshman and I wasn't even enrolled in that school um just up there hanging out one day chilling shooting dice and the coach seen me and was like, oh man, I didn't think, I didn't know you went here, we got a game today. And I was like, I don't go here. And they like, so what, come on, we got a game. Let's go get your shoes. And I played JV and I was killing, like it's so crazy, I was killing and I wasn't even enrolled in the school. Um, so basically I did that for like a whole year. So when I went back to school as a sophomore at Cleveland High School, I was a freshman technically. I didn't get no grades, I had all Fs. I was in all freshman classes. It was probably the most embarrassing thing ever. I got kicked off the varsity team. I was forced to play JV all over again. And then that's when I told myself, I gotta get it together because I was so embarrassed being in the class with the freshmen, me being a popular student and everybody knew who I was, but I was considered a dumb student. Even though I was very intelligent, I just didn't go to school. to Compton today, went back to the old spots, yeah. went back to where you got shot the night before you scored 27 and 15. Yeah. It was a violent overnight. Three people shot, one dead, two injured. Just after midnight, police responded. Police shooting, I'm shooting, I'm shooting. I mean, for me, it, it's a little crazy, man. It's unsettling, right? Because I shouldn't be alive today. You know, I got shot right here, man, and a couple other people that was in the car with me got shot. But the same token, them circumstances, bro, shouldn't nobody have lived through that. Because we was boxed in right here. I don't know if y'all want to turn the camera around, get that view or whatever, but a car actually pulled up coming from this direction. And we're facing this direction parked like this vehicle right here, you feel me? And I'm sitting in the passenger seat. The driver, two other gentlemen in the car as well. The other guy that's in the left, go ahead. Who in the car? Like I said, you got my nigga from Park Village, you got me and the passenger, you got Rail sitting behind me, that's the one that passed away, you know what I'm saying, my classmate. You got my other homie Lunatic sitting in the middle, and my nigga Slowpoke jumped out the car to dust the weed off, you feel me? They pull up, they see him. They are enemies, our rivals, you know what I'm saying? So they shoot, they get off, two times with a 44. So remind you now, we're facing this way, they're facing this way. So we're boxed in. When they get off with the 44, it jams. They drop it, hang out the window with an AK-47. So now, with the chopper, they giving it to us. So I'm trying to get up on the dashboard. That's my only thing because they caught us off guard. Because we was just, you know, talking about the paper. You know, uh, I was in the paper, of course. Upcoming basketball game. 
you know, big CIF match. So while we're all out there, you know, we're just reviewing the paper, talking about, you know, these matchups, shit like that. So now when they say their neighborhood, we know that they're not from over here. So I drop the paper, I look, and as they give out, you know, where they from, they shoot. When they shoot, like I say, the 44, it jam, pick the AK up. That's when they really get to shooting at us. So now from this point, I'm this way. So I'm trying to get under a dashboard. As you can see, I'm 6'10", you know, with these shoes on. So I'm in the 87 Cutlass, y'all. Y'all know what it is, four door. So I'm trying to get Summer up under this motherfucking dashboard to stop these shells from hitting at me, right? My man is sitting behind me because of course, his legs is like this because my seat is back because I'm so big. So he can't go anywhere because any car nowadays, you can tell them slants in the window. So he can't bob and weave at bullets that's coming his way. You see what I'm saying? So now as they're coming in, cause niggas is just shooting. He take one to the head, one to, you know, the stomach area, a lot of them to the thighs. But the one that did it was the one to the head. Now for me, you know, I'm the passenger. My back is up in the air. I take two, they go through my back. You feel me? So if I would have flinched, I'd have been paralyzed. The thing about it, I was so balled up and so tight to where I wasn't worried about flinching. You see what I'm saying? I'm worried about when these motherfuckers gonna stop shooting me. That's what I'm on. Those they shoot. I'm talking about, they got, a, they got a chopper though. They got an AK-47. So as these bullets go, like I say, the driver takes one to the arm. So now as they pull off, the first thing I do is I get out. So now as I get out, I can turn right here. I'm standing right here like this. So I'm, shit, am I good? I'm good, right? Because I don't see anything in my face. But at the same token, it felt like a person would take this rag and boil it for about 25, 30 minutes, man. And then just throw it directly on your back. And I'm talking about that's how that, that fucking hot ass, that lead start to feel, right? The whole time, my homie that was sitting behind me is, you know, his noodles is out. His brains is out. I see this, so I can't react to it. The person that's sitting in the middle asking somebody to hold me. You know, hey, my nigga, I'm like, bro, I'm, you know, I don't know what the fuck to do at this point. I'm, I'm in shock, but I'm looking. That towel, remember? Ah, it, it got hot on me, right? So now I'm like, what the fuck? Man, what? What is this? They like, my nigga, you leaking. I'm like, I'm leaking? Reminds you now, my car is parked over there. So I walk and look in the reflection of the car. I see it. So now my homies is coming from around the corner. You know, everybody's running because they heard all the shots. So now, you know, the other homie that got shot in the arm, he's calling for the paramedics. So now my homie's in the back asking somebody to hold him because he got shot all in the stomach area. The other person that was behind me was dead on the scene impact right there as they call it dead on arrival that's what it is right so now sitting there it fucks me up to stand here now and relive that but the message is to get across that we're trying to do something out here in these streets we've been out here we just trying to wake y'all up so either y'all gonna wake up or get woke up that's how it is we really out here real motherfuckers real people and i said motherfuckers edit that out Right? But it's real people out here. That's where I'm at with it. After this happened, Palmer called Palmer called D and said, hey man, we knew that his we knew that one of his friends had been killed. Basically his brain's blown out. And we basically said, hey Dave, you ain't gotta play, man. We played, we played, that was a Friday night that happened. It happened on a Friday. We played Santa Margarita on a Saturday. I got a hoop. At UC Irvine. I got a hoop. Palmer calls Dave, says, look, man, like we know how traumatic the situation is. We, you know, like you don't have to play. Yeah. Let me tell you what Dave says. Dave says, I'm playing. No, you said, fuck it, cuz I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, and there it is. Baby. That's what you said. <laughs> fuck it, cuz I'm playing. Yeah. Here was our elementary school. We had like a little daycare preschool type joint, 
right here in this lot. And this next lot right here was a boys and girls club, man. And Tell them what it meant to you. You know, the, boy, the, the, the boys and girls club was, was everything to me. Because like I said, growing up in this type of environment and the low income section eight type housing projects, the Boys and Girls Club allowed us to go experience things that I would have never experienced. Without that Boys and Girls Club, honestly, um, nobody from my neighborhood, including myself, we wouldn't have experienced anything as far as extracurricular activities. You know, we never really left our neighborhood. We never went out to dinner with our family or went to Knott's Berry Forum or went to a Clipper game or anything, or a Dodger game. Like that's something that our parents would have never did for us because they probably wasn't able or not interested. But with that community center, we was able to go out and explore and, and, and have fun and, and do certain things that other people was doing in their normal lives that we just didn't know about. And the community center kind of helped us stay on our toes because at the Boys and Girls Club, everybody couldn't go. So if you got suspended from school or you acting up or if your mama, you been disrespectful, you can't go. So when you on that bus and that bus drive off on the way to Raging Waters and you sitting on that sidewalk waving to everybody, that's heartbreaking. So then you making sure you do what you got to do in school. And now you're on top of your behavior because you make sure you make that next trip. And that's why I thought that the incentives that was you know brought to us from that Boys and Girls Club was amazing for me because I know it helped me out because I never want to miss out on anything. So, so, so right here, man, this is, ah, this is, this is real tough for me, man. And yeah, I'm with you. Stand right here. You're close. This is, this is Ujima Village. Yeah. This is a place it's I've home. been knowing my whole life, man. Yeah. Get it out, baby. This home. So when you see things like this happening, man, get it out. Let them know what it means to you. How you feel about it? You know, it's something. This all you've been knowing your whole life. Maybe came in here and did this, but here it is. You know, hey man, let them know how that makes you feel. But at the same token, what they, how determined you are to change certain things, bro, and how to push forward, man. Like I was saying, man, that boy, that boy, the girls club meant everything to me. My community meant everything to me. Yeah. And. This, 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 this housing projects, man, this Section 8 low income housing is everything I've ever known my whole life. Yeah. Ujima Village, man, and for them to take away, the city took it away and they knocked our projects down and they kicked us out and they just left us out to dry to be homeless. And every memory I ever got from how I learned how to dribble a ball or learn how to, you know, do anything, everything I've ever done, it, it, was, it was learned in this this apartment complex and we right here on 126th Street and Wildsworth Avenue. And this is just everything I've ever known. So it just sucks. Every time I come over here, it's just real emotional. No matter how many times I come, you know, everything I know came from there, came from Ujima Village and just to go back and drive down 126th Street and to see nothing. And they're actually extending the park right now, but just to see my old apartment building gone and you know, the, the soil that I was born and raised in and played everything in and ran around all day, it just gone. So it's just really sad. And, you know, even to this day, it's been about a decade since they knocked it down. And every time I see it or think about it, it's, it's very emotional and very sad just thinking about it. Um, you know, so I definitely miss, I, I, I miss my, my, my neighborhood and I miss Ujima Village. It felt like it felt good, like like you said, just just coming from Compton, and I wasn't a big basketball name. I had to work every every year to get better. Freshman year, uh, tried out for the varsity team and made it. I mean, I, I didn't know what to expect. I, I didn't really know how to play. I was just you know just leaned on my athleticism uh, and, uh, you know, Telpin Palmer took a chance on me, gave me a chance. I didn't play a lot, but, you know, just to be up there with the, with the older guys and practice and things like that, working on my game, it, it, was, it was good. I, I got my first dunk in, in the spring league, and after that, it just took off. The game just took off. Uh, junior year was, I, I did good junior year. Got invited to uh, Nike All-American camp. Uh, started getting letters and stuff my junior year, and that's when I started taking it serious. Like, oh damn, I could go to college off this. 
And so Tope and them used to, Tope and Palmer used to press me, try to get me to work out on my game. I was out of there, just tried to get me to work on my shot. I was working on dunks, but I mean, uh, it, it turned out we had a good, I had a good junior and senior year and ended up getting a scholarship. So going from high school to college is, is a big jump. Uh, you know, all the guys are athletic as you, they're as, as, just as strong as you and things like that. So you really have to work on your game. So I came in with the knock that I couldn't shoot. So, uh, you know, I'll, the coaches will work with me. You know, you have to work on your game. You got to get better if you want to play. So I went in there and worked, worked real hard freshman year. I, got, uh, I played a little bit my freshman year. And every year I got more and more playing time. In the summers, off seasons, I was always working out, working on my jump shot. Junior year, I really did, I did good. I led, I, led, I was in a pack 10, like, like in top, I was in the top 10, like in five or six different categories, steals, three pointers, uh, rebounds and things like that. I mean, I just tried to do everything, everything. Uh, defend, shoot, steal, pass, whatever I could to get on, to stay on the floor. Scalabrini leads it, back shot. Trapagne with the tip dunk. Rebound goes to Scalabrini, outlet pass, Trapagne, watch out, again. Granville down the lane, the kick, Trapagne sets and hits. A three-pointer for Jeff Trapagne. He has seven points. Uh, the whole the draft is a whole process, and one of the big knocks was, uh, you know, can I shoot? Can I shoot? Up until that that first senior camp, like I was working on my game every day, shooting in the gym every day, two shooting. three times a day. Yeah, yeah, every day. So um, it was your trainer in the morning and me at night. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, like you said, two days just getting it in at the gym, and uh, I killed that. I killed that camp. I killed that. I was shooting all over the place. And I think everybody, everybody was shocked, really. It, it was, they were shocked, because they was like, they was expecting me just to come in there. Dunk on people. Yeah, dunk on people, get a couple dunks. But I was hitting them with the threes, hesitation threes, follow it, like all kind of stuff. And so that, that, that helped my sock right there. That helped get me back, get my name back into the, uh, like the first round talk. Bell stripped, Granville throws it ahead. Here comes Trapagne, another reverse jam. USC showing the flair for the dramatic here in Uniondale. Well, I think it's the worst it's ever been um, as far as just killings and murders and back when we had the murder capital back in the days and, you know, other cities kind of took over, but I think Compton is, is it's, it's, it's living up to that name now, and it's, it's really sad, and it's kind of hard to do what we want to do in the city, in the community, with everything that's going on. And At the end of the day, what can you do? All we can do is bring awareness. We can keep on trying to, you know, do the work that we are doing in the community. Yes. But we need help. Each one teach one. That's the thing. We just out here being raw with it. It's just being real right now, you know? I'm like, man, look, I'm gonna give it to you uncut, just raw. Like, it ain't gonna be on some, you know, hey, I'm gonna be bougie or I'm gonna be this. Nigga, I'm in my hood. I feel good. I'm sweating my ass off. Growing up, like we keep saying, we seen these things every day. This is not something we're just gonna, like, keep glorifying, right? This is something that's on the normal. People got niggas that die every day. My thing was this, homie. I've seen it. What could I do about it? At Cleveland High, I was able to play AAU ball and I played for some teams in the Valley and we traveled and we, you know, we did a little stuff. But coming back to Compton, getting, you know, reunited with all my friends and playing with Compton Magic. And this is a program that my big brother played for when he was in high school and, you know, everybody played for. So of course I love everything with Compton Magic. I was already familiar with Atope and, 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 and Coach Palmer. So, you know, those first couple trips with Compton Magic, it meant everything to me because, you know, them the only times I ever got a chance to leave the city of Compton, really. You know, um, if it wasn't for basketball, I'd just be in my neighborhood every day, getting caught up like all my other homies got caught up. But when they was getting caught up, I was on the weekend playing ball with Compton Magic out of state, or even if I was in the city, I was somewhere being productive. So, you know, just, just being a part of Compton Magic, it came perfect in a time of my life where I started taking basketball really serious and you know I really feel like it, it helped save my life really because it kept me distracted and it kept me out of the neighborhood 
when my neighborhood was reckless at the time. So, you know, those first couple trips with Compton Magic and it was just great just to be on a trip with my brothers, with my friends I grew up with, just to be in that family environment and to be out the neighborhood and go and explore the city and other cities and other states. And, you know, it just gave me something to live for. I mean, listen, bro, to see it now, which I don't know a lot of these dudes, but I've been watching, right? It's, it's not just a blessing, bro, but it's an opportunity just to be a part of something that's special. Because, nigga, to wear that across your chest, Compton, but for the world to see it now in a different light, that's what it's about, bro. Because we ain't all fucked up. You know what I'm saying? We ain't all bad people, dog. You know what I mean? We just trying to get up out of here. I mean, man, I'm back in the city to where, nigga, I should have been dead at. You understand me? Like, like, that's why I'm just like, it's not only unreal, homie, but to be back and trying to do something, you know, uplifting. And to be back on the scale to where, you know what I mean, like, I'm able to have a conversation with you. And we're able to do this and put it on the platform so people can see it, right? That's what's crazy. That's what, that's, that's what got me like, man, I should have been dead here, but I'm back here doing this. That's the point though. You see what I'm saying? Like, but that's the craziness to it all for me because I can't describe that much of it. I can give you a, a, a piece of it, but for me to go forward, I can't, homie. Because I don't supposed to be here. Not right here. Nigga don't stop and just pull up and glorify this shit. <laughs> but if this is what I gotta do, I'll get that message out by saying that. It's hot out here, and I ain't talking about just the heat. Niggas out here dying. Motherfuckers are still out here fighting to give a message. That's what I'm saying. Whether it's hot, yak, whatever, we still hot. Man, going to college, my mind frame was just basketball. I've always been very smart. I walk into a classroom and get straight A's with giving just a little effort, but I didn't care about anything academics. I didn't care about school. I went to play basketball. Um, so a degree wasn't on my mind, to be honest. It was just really just to play basketball, enjoy the world, enjoy the girls. College wasn't preached in my household. I'm the first one to actually go to college and graduate. So it wasn't nothing that was like mandatory. Nobody talked about it. It wasn't like a thing that we had to do, you know? So um, I just remember getting hurt in college real bad and finding out I had a real bad back problem. After my junior year, my back just wouldn't get better. I had a few herniated discs and the doctor didn't clear me. And I remember flying home and I was like, I'm not going back to school. And I'm so happy that, you know, my mom pressured me to go back to school and finish getting my degree because it really worked out for me because it really started off my new career as a coach. And now I was able to coach college basketball um, at Compton College for eight years and, you know, get my master's degree and be able to teach classes at the college as well. So, you know, all that stuff really worked out. So. It was a long journey, it was tough, but it definitely worked out for me in the end. How about this? Authentic lifestyle for mean? me, what right? What does that mean? For me, that's my life, homie. For me, I've been doing this for 41 years come October 16th, right? I ain't never had nothing given to me, homie. Whether it was Auburn, Compton Magic, whatever, right? I always had to bust my ass. So for me, this is my brand. I'm gonna bust my ass to get the people something different, something that's authentic, something that I'm gonna keep it 100 with, right? I'm gonna put my blood, sweat, and tears in it. That's what you get. You get everything that's with, within me, everything within David Hamilton, right? But I'm pushing for a direction of at-risk youth, even though I'm getting hot as hell, right? My thing is to stop this pipeline from going from the streets to the penitentiary. You know, you got ACES program, you know? If y'all not familiar with that, man, adverse childhood experiences, correct? Like, listen, we just talked about issues that we've been traumatized with, right? People being incarcerated, people being shot, people going through all this. My brand is bringing awareness to that. That's what we're doing. And I'm bringing it authentic. It's a lifestyle. It's a brand. It's a way to say, hey, it's awareness to where we have been doing something here, but we could turn our life around and do something here. Yes, sir. This is the positive side of growing up. But you have to have a great 
team around you. You gotta have a circle. I can't come to this man if I don't have something to come with him, I mean, come at him with. So I brought him something where I've been doing my own work and I put my footwork in there to change my name, to change my brand. Authentic lifestyle. Go ahead. And the reason I wore this shirt today is because this is something that he created and it's called Create a Legacy Fun Day that we had. And Bernard had the idea of going into the elementary and middle schools with uh, a program for, and we, we started with Tibby, uh, Mayo, and McKinley, and going into these elementary schools and middle schools and giving them difference, differences and things that they could do that brought him back to where he was. So the reason I wore this shirt is, is really symbolic of, of him and, and some of the ideas that he had to help empower kids, to help empower youth, to help empower Compton, to help empower what he lost here. So first, I just want to say thank you so much for allowing us to come to your school, to Mayo, and drop welcome. off some books. I went to elementary school in Compton, middle school, and high school in Compton. Um, we just want to tell y'all and encourage y'all to stay in school, to keep reading, to listen to your teachers. Um, and we're going to definitely reward y'all for reading and for taking care of your business in the classroom, for sure. The awesome part is this, we have a lot more surprises coming. What? Oh hold on, hold on. What? We're gonna ask your teachers and your administrators if you're behaving and doing good academically. That's important. Yeah. 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 Yeah, man, these kids, they know Compton Magic as big time basketball, but now when I'm in the city, I go to the park or the grocery store, people are coming up to me, parents are coming up to me saying, thank you. Oh, you're the one who dropped the books off and kids coming to me to the park like, hey, I remember you came to my school and gave me books. You know, little stuff like that is just so amazing. It's bigger than basketball. Like that's, that's so amazing to me. And you know, that's why we just continue to do what we do. So for him to go from here to high school, to figuring out a way to make it through high school through all these issues, to college, to getting his degree, which he has his degree, to coming back, to throwing back all the things that he's doing in the neighborhood and all the things he's trying to do for kids. Um, again, it's, it's, it's just, I thought it was really important that we came back to Ground Zero. It's very emotional for him. And we come, we've come here before on Wadsworth and 126. We've been here before taking pictures, but it's very emotional for him, but I think it's very important that everybody knows um, we come back here so he can remember, so he can figure out how he can take some other kids forward. What can I do to make this path easier for other kids that are in my situation?